John Logan, we're going to be hearing from him next. And um, he is a professor of sociology at Brown University. And he directs the S4 initiative, Spatial Structures in the Social Sciences. That's correct? OK. That's so cool. I love that little acronym, S4. Um, he has um, been at Brown for a few years now, but for a long time before that, he was at SUNY Albany. Um, you might know him um, from his famous book, uh, co-authored with Harvey Mollich, um, Urban Fortunes, The um, Political Economy of Place. Uh, I study neighborhoods, and I, and I like to map neighborhoods. And uh, I'd like to show you some maps. The, the maps are the cool thing. And I even have uh, some other kind of illustrations that I'd like to share with you. But while I'm waiting for that, uh, uh, I'd like to say something about how the work that I'm doing is similar to and, and uh, uh, different from what you just saw uh, from, from Luke and uh, Sarah. Uh, it's similar in the sense that I'm also into big data and I'm also into trying to uh, make use of information where I know the specific point where, where, where something is happening. Uh, rather than accepting administrative data on census tracts or, or something and using that to, uh, to describe a neighborhood. Is that, I wonder if it's the right computer. Hopefully, yeah. We have so many maps just flying around. Oh, man, the University of Chicago. Wow. <laughs> Mac heaven. I, I, I should have pulled up my iPhone and, and beamed up an image for you or something. That, that'll happen. That'll happen one of these days. Okay, so just start it up. Yeah. So uh, the the biggest difference between my presentation and Luke's is that that I'm uh, much more traditional in the way that I'm thinking about neighborhoods. But but the difference points out something interesting about neighborhoods, and that is, uh, we uh, uh, I'm I'm going to talk about neighborhoods in terms of places where people live. But what I mean by where people live is. Is, is where they sleep at night, you know, it's, it's their residence. And, uh, and there's another way to think about neighborhoods that I think is equally valid, but it's uh, not, not nearly as much explored by, uh, by any of us, and that's where people spend time and what they do in, in the places where they are spending time uh, other parts of the day. And uh, yeah, sp so I'm going back to a much more traditional uh, perspective, uh, and I'm asking, though, the same question, what is the neighborhood? And I'm trying to take big data. Actually, I've got data on where everybody lives. Uh, did I do something? I'm going to get wireless access now for all of you. Uh, I probably put my finger on the pad. Ah, OK. So uh, I'm going to try to figure out what the neighborhoods are, although you could just ask people and they would tell you. Uh, but that's not, that's not my approach. I'm a quantitative person. But if you just ask people, uh, this is a kind of a map that some crazy guy might make, and, and it has some validity to it. Uh, there's a, the a Chinatown that is described here as Noodle Stand and very gay stand, that's, I guess that must be Greenwich Village, and Zabara stand is the Upper West Side, and so, you know, so, and these are kind of roughly neighborhoods that, uh, as people experience them and, and might perceive them, and I think there's a great deal of value in trying to understand neighborhoods from that perspective, but a difficulty is that different people would see different things, and it's very hard to, to, to take like the aggregate of what everybody says and say, okay, therefore the neighborhood is this or it's that. Uh, an interesting other aspect about neighborhoods is the degree to which even collectively people seek to create neighborhoods. The, the, the neighborhood has an importance to people and people want to, they want to put a name to it and they want to put boundaries to it and sometimes it's a real estate venture. You know, you can make more money out of selling in this neighborhood if you give it a fancier name or you change its, you, you, you kind of secede from the larger sort of disreputable neighborhood that you're part of and become your own separate little autonomous neighborhood with a different and maybe sexier name. And this happens all the time. And I just happened to run into this article 
in the New York Times this past week about a, a neighborhood in the Bronx that, geez, I never heard of Allerton, but uh, maybe it's a real neighborhood and maybe it's the more real neighborhood than, than something else that's up there. So I'm going to, to not use this kind of perceptual uh, measurement of neighborhoods. I'm going to, to take the other approach, just very much like uh, Luke and Sarah did, of trying to inductively figure out what the neighborhoods by looking at how people are distributed across space with different kinds of characteristics. And to some extent now I'm departing from an idea that I heard I think last night and again this morning that a real neighborhood is notable for its diversity. A real neighborhood is diverse and that's or maybe it's a good neighborhood is diverse and I'm taking exactly the opposite stance that that uh, that you know a neighborhood because of the lack of diversity in it. That the same kind of people live there. I know where Chinatown is because that's where all the Chinese are. And I could tell what the boundary of Chinatown is if I find at what point, you know, you're, you're moving out in space, at what point uh, there's not any Chinese anymore. And that's, and that's the way I'll talk about a Chinese neighborhood. Or I could talk about a rich neighborhood. Or I could talk about a family-based neighborhood. Or I could talk about an immigrant neighborhood on the basis of that characteristic and how people with that characteristic are distributed in space. Uh, and so I have a number of problems uh, in doing that. And one is, uh, to echo something that Luke also said, is that I don't know what criterion I should use. Is the important thing how many Chinese live there or how many immigrants live there? Or is it actually a matter of social class? That the, in Flushing, it's about middle class uh, immigrants and they happen to be Chinese. But in uh, lower Manhattan, it's about working class immigrants and they happen to be Chinese. Is it, I'd like to, to, to understand what is the dimension along which people are actually sorting themselves in space and, and constituting separate neighborhoods. So this is the kind of uh, uh, work that I'm trying to do. And uh, yeah, so that's what, I, that's what that slide says. So now uh, to illustrate this, this idea, I'm going to show you a map of the black neighborhoods in New York City. And, and I, I don't know, but, but you're not going to recognize that as a map of black neighborhoods in New York City because what I did is I took, this is just a census tract map. I took all the census tracts and randomly put them in a different location. And so it suggests that very black neighborhoods and not black at all neighborhoods are just kind of randomly spread around the city. And, uh, and you, can't find, you can't find Harlem, and you can't find Bedford-Stuyvesant, and you can't find neighborhoods that, that in, the, in people's consciousness are, I didn't, I didn't really touch it, I, <laughs> I, I promise. I, I stepped on a, I stepped on this cord, but I, I, don't, I, no, I, don't, I don't think that no. did it. <laughs> Okay, so I'm back. So, 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 so you don't expect the map of black neighborhood, black settlement in New York City to look like this at all. You expect to see more clusters, which is in the real map, that's what you see. That's the real map. And, and so in the same way I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that I can figure out what the black neighborhoods of New York are by seeing what the clusters are. And again, this is exactly the same general kind of spatial clustering methodology that, that Luke and Sarah used in their work. Uh, and it is rather uh, extreme, you know, like it's, for people who don't really know New York, you might have thought, you're here in Chicago, you thought Chicago was the most segregated city in America, but actually the New York is right up there with it. Okay. So, uh, so, um, 
by mapping neighborhoods, I learn a number of kinds of things that are of interest to me as an urban sociologist, and I'm interested not just in knowing how segregated different groups are from each other across space, but where are their neighborhoods, how many people live in those neighborhoods, how dense they are in terms of a concentration of a particular kind of group, uh, how do they grow, or do they actually contract over time, and at what spatial scale can you find them? I'm particularly interested in the question of spatial scale, which is one that came up uh, very prominently this morning. You heard like uh, a five minute walk is the spatial scale of a neighborhood. Uh, and it might be, it, it, it might well be. On the other hand, it could be that the spatial scale of a neighborhood is just a single street segment from this intersection to that intersection. And in fact, uh, sociologist Rick Granis published a book in which he argued at the very beginning, he said, a neighborhood is a street segment, and that's the building block of neighboring. So, okay, maybe so, but it also could be that, well, let me take you back. It could be that an area as large as, well, that, that purple area way to the east is Jamaica, Queens. That's a very large area. Maybe, maybe it's meaningful as a neighborhood, too sociologically meaningful in terms of what kinds of people live there, who they, who they are in touch with, and perhaps even other things such as what kinds of resources are available to them in that area. So I don't want to take any particular spatial scale for granted. I'd like to get it inductively out of the data, let the data tell me at what scale do people sort themselves out. So, uh, uh, to, to illustrate the idea about change in neighborhood boundaries over time, uh, I pulled up some data I've been working with uh, from Chicago. And uh, in 1880, I've, I've, uh, this is just a map of the enumeration districts in Chicago at that time. I think you can sort of figure out where the, the loop is just sort of just barely north of, of that black concentration, which is a little bit to the north of where African-American settlement ended up being within a fairly short time. But uh, they're very like 1% black in Chicago in, in 1880, but they were quite concentrated. Most areas of the city had exactly zero, and then a few areas had more. And it looks like there's a kind of a zone uh, there that's of interest and then I can follow it over time. But before I do that, I want to point out that at another spatial scale, I see something else. And what I've done here is I've taken all of the people who lived on a particular block of State Street. And I chose a block, not the block that is like all black, because there, there are several in the very core of the black neighborhood or black settlement area of Chicago in 1880 was, was pretty much 90% black. But on, the, on its fringes are areas that are majority white. And uh, historians uh, have in the past talked about how, in fact, at this early time before 1900 and 1910, uh, African Americans weren't really very segregated because uh, uh, the majority of them lived in neighborhoods and they were using wards, political wards, which are a very large area but wards that are uh, uh, majority white. So on this, uh, on this slide, I'm just showing you a particular very mixed block on the edge of the black settlement area. Uh, and I've identified individual buildings by uh, racial composition. And you'll notice something interesting about this, which is that uh, most buildings are all white, and a few buildings are uh, all black or almost all black. And so there is a very high level of segregation on this street segment at the scale of the building. It raises a question for me whether the building in 1880 with respect to African Americans is the more meaningful spatial unit to talk about neighboring and social networks and, and what your opportunities are in the housing market and where you can live and where you can't live. Could it, be the, could it be the building itself? Or is it really the street segment? Or is it really the larger area that became the south side? 
so uh, I put that in question, and my own conclusion is that, that if I were studying 1880, in, in most northern cities, there are so few African Americans that if I wanted to, to identify the settlement pattern in terms of neighboring, in terms of what I might call neighborhoods, I would choose a spatial scale much smaller than, uh, than people ever think about as a neighborhood. The building with four, five, seven housing units in the building, maybe. Okay, and then we can see how this uh, progressed over time. Uh, this is a, a map that never existed before in history. I'm really proud of it. Uh, I have a colleague uh, at Pittsburgh whose brother is a, a kind of an NSA uh, computer guy, and and he went onto Ancestry.com and and scraped all of the Im images, and then we've turned it into a data set for every resident of Chicago in 1900, 1910, 20, and 30. And then we've created maps of the enumeration districts in each of those years. So we can now have a map that shows uh, in, uh, in great detail uh, what, 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 what was the black part of Chicago over time. And we can study neighborhood change. If if I take seriously the idea that I know what the black neighborhood is by the boundaries of where blacks are versus where they aren't, right? And that black neighborhood, that blackness is the identifying feature that's important to me as an analyst. And so you'll, you'll see that uh, between 1900 and 1910, there was a little bit of uh, expansion, but not very much change, but by 1920, which is before most people place the, the, the creation of the real intense black ghetto in Chicago. Most people say it's a post-World War I phenomenon, the early 20s, the period when uh, there were, you know, in Hyde Park there were bombings and stuff like that going on. But in fact, uh, as early as 1920, there's a, a very strong pattern. And by 1930, it just, it just drew a little bit uh, more to the south and, and uh, a little bit more intense, actually. So, so this is a, so I could study the evolution of black neighborhoods if I were willing to take this as my indicator of what the black neighborhood is. I could say, whatever is the cluster on the south side of, of uh, predominantly black areas, I could say that's the black neighborhood and its boundaries changed over time. And I could ask the question, what percent of blacks in Chicago lived in the black area? And I could ask, how, how rich or how poor was the black area? And how did that change over time? And I could ask, did rich blacks as well as poor blacks live in the black neighborhoods? So a number of things that I'd be interested in knowing about neighborhoods, about residential patterns, uh, I could get by working with data at this scale. I have a, I have two pro, actually, several projects that I'm linking together now and calling the Urban Transition HGIS project. And the urban transition for me represents that period of time when America went from a predominantly rural country, 80% rural in 1880, to uh, more than half urban, that was around 1920, and really predominantly urban by 1940. And I'm trying to, uh, doing my best to study how this happened over time and trace it. And for both 1880 and 1940, I have uh, a 100% digital transcription of the census. So I know in 1880 I got 50 million records, and in 1940 I've got 150 million records. And my job has been to figure out how to geocode those people, given their addresses, correctly onto a historical street grid. It's a very, very, uh, very ambitious geographical project. Uh, and uh, I've completed it for 1880, and I just got the grants that will allow me to do it in the next five years for 1940. And so what could I do if I had data on everybody with respect to understanding the character of neighborhoods? Uh, this is the kind of information I, I have. This is, I've kind of summarized 
the kind of information that I'm working with, but you can see this is for a, a small area of Newark, New Jersey. And for every building, I've given it a symbol that tells me whether it's a predominantly Irish, German, Yankee, or ethnically mixed building. Uh, and I've also identified with colors, I've identified the street segment that people lived on and is it a predominantly Irish, German, Yankee, or mixed street segment. And then notice that for a single household, a single building, I listed all the members of the household, and you see what I know about those people. I know this about everybody in every building. Their age, their ethnicity, their name, their relation to the head of the household. SEI is a, is, tells me what their occupation was. So I know a lot about these people. What could I induce about neighborhoods from that. And so I'm going to move forward. Well, now I've mapped people in Newark in 1880, individual buildings by uh, ethnicity. Uh, and the green dots are Germans. I'll only mention the Germans because if you look at the map for a little while, you can visualize, you can see an area that you'd be willing to call a German neighborhood. But the question is, okay, I can see it's mostly German, but at what point does it stop? What are the boundaries of that neighborhood? And we've applied uh, rather sophisticated, complicated spatial clustering methods to try to identify what the boundaries are. But you can see it, and this is at the level of the specific building or if I aggregate the buildings to a street segment and talk about predominantly German street segments, those are, that's the red areas, and it becomes more clear if I go to a larger spatial unit, uh, a group of street segments that are connected to each other. So I can do that. The other thing that I have done is to, to try to ask, what is the basis of the sorting process of people into neighborhoods where I don't take a single variable at a time, like say, oh, I want to know where the German neighborhoods, I'll see what, where are the Germans. That's relatively simple. But now I want to ask, uh, I got all these people and they're spread out across the city, and I want to know what's the, what, are the, what are the dimensions that determine how they are spread out across the city. To what extent is it their ethnicity, that people of the same ethnicity tend to live together? To what extent is it their social class, people with similar occupational levels live together? Or people who are married and have children, they tend to live in some areas and people, single adults, live somewhere else? Or immigrants live in different areas than, than non-immigrants? Anything that I could measure, I could throw into this model. And uh, I'm using a method called a discrete choice model in which I essentially ask for every person, I say, I know what street segment you live on, and I want to know what is it about that street segment that makes it distinctive that, you've cho that you live there as opposed to one of the others, one of the 1,400 other street segments in the city. It's, a, it's like, a, for those of you who know this kind of thing, it's like a multinomial logit, but with 1,400 different possible outcomes. And I would not have thought that you could do this, but somebody told me that I could, and I tried it out, and by golly, you can. So you can run this model, and you can find out, you, you know, you get a bunch of coefficients, and the coefficients in the blue zone tell you how important occupation is as a predictor, and the yellow zone tells you how important nativity is, and then, so I've got these coefficients that tell me what variables are most important. This could mean that my time really is up. <laughs> but I'm almost done, so. And the answer is, in Newark in 1880, ethnicity trumps everything. Race and ethnicity, by far, like more than half of the spatial pattern of where people live is because they're living with people of a similar race and ethnicity. And then social class comes in a, a distant second along with nativity. And family composition is a very, like, not very important predictor. So on the basis of this, I can't tell you what are the neighborhoods, but I can tell you what's behind the making of the neighborhoods. Why are there 
the neighborhoods in Newark at this time. And I could compare it to, say, the 1940s, when you might think in the 1940s, oh, by then, maybe social class really is the big thing. And immigration is more of a, you know, an ethnicity, being German, being even Italian, not so important anymore, but being black still is. Well, I could find that out using this kind of a method. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. My answer of what is the neighborhood, if it's based on the population composition, on the assumption I know it's the neighborhood because similar people live together there, then I can answer questions like, uh, what's it based on? What are its boundaries? How many people live there? What kind of people get recruited there and live somewhere else? And how do they decide to move or stay would be another thing that I could try to trace over time. Uh, this is only one of the ways that I think is uh, meaningful to describe neighborhoods quantitatively. I think electoral boundaries are quite important because they often have a direct impact on the representation of people and their issues and their concerns in the political process. I think that air and water pollution exposure, which doesn't fit any of these boundaries very directly, is equally important, or hazards from a natural climate events like Hurricane Sandy, for example, or access to jobs or schools. I think schools is the major one, but for some people it's shopping. They're all potential uh, bases of neighborhoods, but the way that I'm approaching it is entirely a population composition. Okay, thank you.